You're about to take the first step on the longest journey of your life. Newport, somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. July 2209. April Ryan, a student at the Venice Academy of Visual Arts, wakes up from a recurring nightmare. A dream of another world, of dragons, spirits, and magic. Of chaos. My name is Rebecca, and this is The Longest Journey, The Last Great Point and Click Adventure, Part 1. In this first part, I will mostly be talking about the setting, specifically about Stark, one of the twin worlds of The Longest Journey. So, let's start at the beginning, over 12,000 years ago, when there was only one world. A world of both order and chaos, science and magic, and of balance. The balance is the main element of the dualistic cosmology of The Longest Journey, not dissimilar to the yin and yang of ancient Chinese philosophy. It has existed since the beginning of time and it represents the equilibrium between order and chaos in the universe. Although it's not limited to that, as it also represents the equilibrium between every set of opposing forces and notions. The coexistence of magic and science allowed humans to harness universe-altering powers, to make stars dance, and even to create life itself. But by doing so, they put themselves and the magical races in great danger, and created an imbalance between chaos and order, or logic. Because this had happened before on other worlds, the dry kin, four ancient and incredibly powerful beings, intervened to save the Earth. Together with 13 human scholars, the Sentinel was created, which divided the Earth into two opposing worlds, Stark and Arcadia. Stark, representing order, is a futuristic version of our world, where technology advanced greatly since the divide, and magic has been relegated to fairy tales forgotten by the collective memory. Its twin, Arcadia, on the other hand, is a world of magic and chaos. But scientifically and technologically, although not necessarily culturally, stuck around the level of the Stark Middle Ages. I'll start with Stark, because it's the most familiar as well as probably the most interesting of the two worlds. Stark in the 23rd century had become a cyberpunk dystopia even more so than the real world. Corporations now control and monitor pretty much every aspect of public life. Public services such as healthcare, education, and transit are divisions of one of the handful of megacorps that own everything. The official status of police departments is somewhat unclear, as while marketing material for the game called the Newport Police a division of MTI, the game itself doesn't explicitly mention this connection, instead simply stating that it's sponsored by two other megacorps. Whatever the case may be, the Newport Police Department regularly enforces so-called corporate offenses, often with deadly force. Such offenses include using the ironically named free access terminals, a voice interface without paying for the upgrade, failure to submit genetic information to a federal database, or even just trying to enter mid-level areas or higher without ID, essentially a corporate enforced case system. Anti-gravity technology has become a fact of life, powering everything from hovercraft, which have replaced regular cars, to shuttles, which ferry passengers and cargo to and from space colonies, to the actual starships themselves. The main megacorps mentioned in the game are Bingo, Bakamba Mercer, and MTI. Bingo is a beverage company, as well as one of the corporations that sponsor MPD, and presumably own and operate one of the subway lines in Newport. In 2159, half a century before the story of the game unfolds, Bingo was involved in the Soda Wars, an armed conflict between soda manufacturers. Bingo was the sole survivor of this conflict. Bakamba Mercer is mainly a space exploration and colonization company, although their interests lie in many other areas as well, as they also sponsor the NPD and operate the Metro Line. BM sponsors space expeditions with the goal of fighting habitable systems for colonization. The colonies are then named after the company with names such as BM Prime or Bakamba 8. Cut content left in the game files suggests that the registration and naming of these systems is done through a separate entity, the Magellan, which, in return for administrating interstellar prospecting, takes a percentage cut from all colonial profits. BM then manipulates poor people into essentially selling themselves off into slavery. They are promised new lives in the colonies, but once there, they become indentured servants, unable to pay off the various predatory fees. 
Contributing to this are pharmaceutical companies which market highly addictive drugs such as Rapture, working hand in hand with BM. The pharmaceutical companies get poor people addicted to amethyn, the active ingredient in raptures, and the colonial reps promise them lifetime supplies of the drug in exchange for their labor. This is actually similar to the way the Magog Cartel operates in the Oddworld series, which I'll eventually also have to talk about this on my channel. MTI, or Malkath Technologies Incorporated, is almost as big as BM, but likely even more powerful. While they don't seem to own entire star systems, MTI certainly do own planets as well as entire private armies, according to Cortez, one of the main characters in the game. I'll talk about him in a future video. MTI is owned by the Church of Voltec, a New Age religious cult, which is itself a front for the Vanguard, an organization which split from the Sentinel at some point after the Divide. MTI seems to have great influence over the Newport Police Department, despite it not being an official sponsor, and they own and operate the Morningstar space station a transfer station where newly arrived colonists wait for the ships that will take them to their colonial assignments. The station is full of shops, bars, and casinos, with the intention of making the colonists spend what's left of their money. Roin Dale, a band that April and her friends are fans of, released a song called These Sons of Bitches with Blood on Their Boots, a few years before the game takes place, to commemorate an event known as the Morning Star Exile. The main Stark setting of the game is Newport, a name which came up multiple times in the video already. Newport is, according to Ragnar Thornquist, the game's writer and director, a currently non-existent urban sprawl covering parts of the Pacific Northwest, perhaps including, without being too geographically specific, present-day Seattle and Vancouver. At the same time, Newport is described by various characters as a place of destiny and power, a great city of the 23rd century. The main areas of the city visited in the game are Venice, Metro Circle, Hope Street, and the Newport Docks. Venice is the home of April Ryan and her friends, living in the Border House as well as the Vava, the prestigious art school they attend, and the Fringe Café, their main hangout spot and April's workplace. Venice is an old industrial district with a bloody history, which has been converted into housing for students and unhoused people in 2109. This came following the Venice massacre of the same year, when the Newport police opened fire on squatters in the district. Venice is heavily based on New York's East Village, where Tornquist lived as a film student in the early 90s. Venice is bohemian, progressive, and multicultural, and actually kind of reminds me of the time I was an art student living in South London. <laughs> the border house, the boarding house where April lives, is owned and ran by a lesbian couple and named so because it sits on the border between two worlds. Fiona, the landlady, named it so because it exists both geographically between Venice and the city proper, and metaphysically between art and spirit on the one hand, and science and technology on the other. That's very poetic, Fiona. The name and explanation gain new meaning with the reveal of Arcadia and the Divide. The bridges, with their iconic clock which stopped at the exact time the Venice massacre occurred, connect the border house to the Fringe and to Vava via Florence Park. The Fringe Cafe is the fairly rundown, although in my opinion pretty cool cafe, where April and Charlie, April's best friend, work. The Fringe is run by April's Eastern European boss and noted stingy callous bastard, Stanley. The cafe, at least occasionally, hosts shows by bands like Harlequin Masquerade, The Go-Getters, and the seemingly punk or punk-adjacent Roindale. In addition to this, the jukebox here plays some really good ambient music by Tor Lindloken, which, in my impressionable mind, I must have been like 8 when I first played this game, forever got stuck as THE cafe soundtrack. Vava, or the Venice Academy of Visual Arts, is the art school that April and her friends are students of. Vava was founded by pro-Venice activist Mary Sam in 2119, who was killed later that year by a corporate assassin. Metro Circle is a downtown Newport area with a reputation for being a neighborhood of clubs, bars, drugs, and sex trafficking. However, Metro Circle also seems to be an important subway hub, as all lines seem to converge here, as well as being an important access point for Newport's upper middle areas like Grendel Avenue. Metro Circle is also home to the Radio Power Building, as well as the Mercury Theatre, a movie theatre which shows early 20th century black and white movies such as The Maltese Falcon from 1941, Casablanca from 1942, in addition to hosting the Bergman Festival. As previously mentioned, Metro Circle is an access point for higher level areas, such as Grendel Avenue, named after Grendel, a monster in the Anglo-Saxon poem Beowulf. Beowulf. <laughs> 
which is in my opinion a bit on the nose. Uh, Metro Mall and Metro Tower, which dominates Newport Skyline. Something that I could never understand about this is that the spaceport and colonial registration are located here, access from the Metro Mall, which means that the people being targeted would actually not have access to the area due to the lack of a mid-level ID. Of course, this is just nitpicking, this was obviously done in order to lock off the area until the player progressed enough, but like I said, I just keep thinking about it. Hope Street is another important location in Newport. Once a new clean housing project, due to decades of neglect and systemic issues, it has become the most dangerous neighborhood in the city. According to April, cabs never stop on Hope Street, although thankfully the subway station is still functional. One of the gangs operating in the area is called the Razor Blades, uh, out of one of the many dilapidated apartment buildings, and April helps and is helped by one of its members during her journey. Another place of interest on Hope Street is the Roman Catholic Cathedral at the end of the street. All of its stained glass windows are intact, suggesting that religion plays a at least marginally important part in the lives of the residents. The priest here, Father Raoul, becomes a contact of April's and is revealed to be a member of the modern-day Sentinel, one of the few remaining in Sark. The last Newport district I'll be talking about here is the Newport Docks. It's actually not a very important location gameplay-wise, it's only visited a few times to talk to another of April's contacts, Burns Flipper, but I feel that it's interesting nonetheless. Due to the sharp decline in maritime shipping caused by the advent of anti-gravity technology, harbors across the world were abandoned, along with the massive cargo ships that they were hosting and building. Together with the ships, most warehouses and industrial equipment, from paint shakers to massive cranes, were abandoned as well. And it's in one of these warehouses where Flipper set up his workshop. Stark is overall a glimpse into one of our possible futures, although a somewhat unlikely one. While corporations continue to grow even more powerful, we are getting terrifyingly close to the dystopia light world of the longest journey Stark. But at the same time, climate issues in Stark have largely been resolved by 2209, and there are even technologies like organic plastic, essentially synthetic plants that actually grow and produce oxygen. Characters in the game mention new synthetic rainforests that produce eight times the amount of the original ones produced. While in real life, corporations seem to have no intention of tackling climate change past vague lip service. The world of Stark was, at various points during development, both the contemporary world circa 1999-2000 and the harsher cyberpunk dystopia, but more on that will be addressed later in the series. The next episode will deal with Arcadia, the world of chaos and magic. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I am looking forward to you looking forward to my next video, which I am also looking forward to.